So today we're going to be talking about Planck charge. And so this video is called Decoding Planck Charge. Now in the previous video, which was called Decoding the Fine Structure Constant, I was able to simplify this um, fairly complex set of, uh, set of terms which are associated with the Fine Structure Constant. And uh, I ended up uh, decoding the anomalous magnetic moment, which is really alpha divided by 2 pi. So now we have um, three terms to um, that evaluate to the anomalous magnetic moment. One is in terms of permittivity, one is in terms of permeability of free space, and one is in terms of the impedance of free space. So these three terms, permittivity, permeability and the impedance are all associated with free space. Now what is free space? Free space is space without matter. So free space is space free of matter. Okay, so, um, so what we're talking about here is the ether. Okay, the ether is space in the absence of matter. So free space is space uh, in the absence of matter. Okay, so that's what um, the permittivity, permeability, and the impedance of free space is all about. So here we're getting to the root of what I'm calling the ether, the medium for the propagation of light, aka the ether. So now what I want to do is I want to simplify this a little bit further by um, incorporating this 4 pi term into these three constants. So when you look at the, um, so let's say when you look at the Coulomb's law, you'll see that permittivity is always coupled with a 4 pi term. And when you look at the Biot-Savart law, you'll see that permittivity is always coupled with a 4 pi term. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create two new three new terms that incorporate the um, the 4 pi term into it. And that way I don't have to keep writing 4 pi. So this just looks prettier when you see epsilon 1 you will know that it means 4 pi epsilon 0. And when you see mu uh, 1, then this is uh, mu 0 divided by 4 pi, and the same with the impedance term. So this is just to simplify the code to make it look a little cleaner so I don't have to write 4 pi all the time, um, but to keep in mind that the 4 pi term is actually in this constant. So I do a similar thing with the 2 pi term, which is found in, uh, in the energy equation, in Planck's energy equation. Um, so here you see when I pull out the 2 pi term, then I have to write uh, reduce Planck's constant times 2 pi times frequency. Uh, so when I group the 2 pi term with the h bar, I write um, non-reduced Planck's constant. But when you group the 2 pi term with the frequency term, then we have to write, we have to use h bar and we have to use angular frequency. I don't use angular frequency in, in my oscillation mechanics because I prefer to talk about um, cycles per second, not cycles per radian. Cycles per radian, um, the physical meaning of cycles per radian is not as clear as the um, visualizing cycles per second. So I'm going to do everything um, using H, uh, using non-reduced Planck's constant and cycles per second. So to recap, we went from here uh, to decoding fine structure constant to uh, actually decoding the anomalous magnetic moment where uh, the anomalous magnetic moment can now be evaluated using these three terms, one in term of, terms of permittivity, one in terms of permeability, and one in terms of the impedance of free space. And this is the value that these three terms uh, evaluate to. This is the anomalous magnetic moment, which is um, alpha divided by 2 pi. So interestingly, through, um, through a lot of uh, number crunching and unit analysis, years and years and years and years of practicing unit analysis, I was able to also simplify the uh, impedance of free space by recognizing that uh, this value here is actually the square root of 
permeability, this one here, divided by permittivity, and uh, this is the value that you get when you use the terms that, um, that I use here that have the 4 pi term embedded in them. And so what you will find is that uh, if you take this value and multiply by 4 pi, you're going to get the standard value that mainstream reports for the um, impedance of free space. And so, um, so this is when I use H and I use the um, anomalous magnetic moment um, and, I, and I fold the 4 pi term into, into permittivity and permeability, then this is the value I get when I take the square root of permeability divided by permittivity. And so uh, I can further simplify this by uh, replacing, uh, by doing this, okay, by doing that. And now uh, I have the anomalous mag magnetic moment in terms of permittivity and perme permeability only. And so now that's just one less, um, one less constant I need to keep track of because I can always calculate it from these two terms. And so, and so we already know that um, the uh, impedance of free space under these conditions evaluates to this value here. Um, I also want to show you that the permittivity now evaluates to this value here, and the, um, the, mag the magnetic constant, the permeability constant, evaluates to 1 times 10 to the minus 7 exactly. And so that's another reason why <clears throat> I like to do this, is because um, this is easy to remember. I can remember 1 times 10 to the minus 7. This is a little more difficult to remember off the top of my head, but... Knowing um, the relationship between permittivity and permeability, I can calculate this given this as long as I know the speed of light, is the exact value of the speed of light, which, um, which is a little bit easier to remember. And so I don't need to remember this. I only need to remember 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And then I can calculate uh, all the other values, including the um, impedance of free space. So um, I just find it interesting that I can write the anomalous magnetic moment in terms of um, permittivity of free space, permeability of free space, and or the impedance of free space. And so what I want to do here is I want to try to do a similar thing with the force equation. And so this is Coulomb's law. This is the force equation. It's got uh, this uh, 1 over permittivity um, permittivity term, which is uh, Coulomb's constant, of course, but I don't write Coulomb's constant. I write 1 over this permittivity term, and this is exactly Coulomb's constant. And so now what I want to do, because I was able to write the anomalous magnetic moment in terms of the permeability of free space, I want to try to do that. And so in order to do that with the force equation, I have to remember that um, the speed of light squared is equal to 1 over permittivity times permeability. And uh, so, what, uh, so that evaluates to this. So I know that this term here is actually equal to c squared times permeability. And so I can write, um, I can write a force equation that is analogous to Coulomb's law. It's Coulomb's law, but written in terms of permeability of free space. Okay, so uh, this actually is really interesting. You're going to find that this is really interesting. Um, so we're going to have a closer look at this. Okay, so you notice there's a c squared term in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that c squared term and I'm just going to move it over here. I'm going to write it over here. And then I'm going to divide both sides by um, d, the distance. Okay, so I write d for distance. I know mainstream and almost everyone in the world writes r for radius, but um, knowing the fact that, you know, Coulomb's law is based on um, uh, the force uh, between charge at distance, I use d instead of r. But it, my way of doing it is actually more accurate because um, these force law, this force law is charge at distance. And so I divide both sides by d, and I end up with 
force times distance is equal to uh, permeability of free space times two, uh, charge one, charge two, divided by distance times c squared. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to group this term here. So force times distance is energy. Force times distance, distance is energy. Now force is, is a vector quantity. So there's also a bunch of vectors, uh, values that you have to take care of in order to do this, which is being done in the background. Um, maybe someday I'll show you how to do that. But uh, force times distance is energy. And so now I have an equation that reads E equals something times C squared. Okay, let's look at it closer. E equals something times C squared. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. E equals something times C squared. Okay, so this, uh, this term here uh, must be, must be um, a mass term. So this term here is the m in E equals mc squared, okay? It's equals, uh, if, if this is the same e equals mc squared as the e equals mc squared, which I'm arguing it is, then this is the mass term associated with this. So I just derived this from scratch. I derived it by um, trying to write... Uh, by trying to write Coulomb's law in terms of the, the permeability of free space. And so uh, this is what we want to look at. What is this? What does this mean? What, is, uh, what, are, what are the implications of this? So what I want to draw your attention to here is that in this equation here, we've got, um, we have a source charge and a target charge. We have two charges that are at distance. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a little schematic. Okay, I'm going to draw a little schematic of what I think this means. So keep in mind that this is just a schematic. This is just a schematic. It is a two-dimensional schematic that um, describes what is what I believe is going on with this equation. And so uh, you'll notice that in this schematic, you've got two little... Um, two little dots here, and I'm going to associate those two, two, two little dots with uh, Q1 and Q2. So these are two charges. These are two charges, whatever that is. These are two, um, two entities that are in a binary orbit around a common center. So uh, we know in, in astronomy that um, a lot of the star systems out there are binary systems that uh, circle around a common center. And so, um, so what, what I'm saying is that uh, this is describing, in my opinion, it is describing uh, two charges that are in motion around a common center. And of course, as you know, when charges are in motion, they create a magnetic field around them. And so this uh, black here is the magnetic field uh, created by this charge, and this white here is the magnetic field created by this charge. So this is what I believe this thing is telling me, and this beautiful yin-yang symbol is just a schematic. It's a nice schematic because it gives you the feeling that something is spinning, that these two um, charges are in orbit, and it also gives you the sensation that there is uh, you know, some sort of field being created around them as they spin. And so this actually is a really nice depiction of, like I said, what I believe is going on with this equation here.